Good afternoon, church. Sorry for the delay in getting this out, but uh, thankfully we're able to do it now. Unusual circumstances in which we're doing it uh, call for unusual measures. So this morning, this evening, afternoon, I'm going to be speaking from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. You know, it's easy to get the idea as Christians that, that the Christian life is just a matter of living according to the law. Or living by the rules and you'll be a good Christian. Well, the truth is, God judges our deeds by our motives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. Well, they, they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their own reward in full. Now, certainly prayer is a good thing. And public prayer is a good thing. But even prayer can be undertaken for wrongful and sinful motives. And these Pharisees prayed openly in the streets, which again was a good thing, but the, the problem was they were not doing it with pure motives. They were, they were doing it with self-serving self and self-seeking motives. They were praying in public in order that men might see them and assume that they were holy and righteous and pious. And, but the reality was they were only satisfying their own fleshly and prideful desires. And what was the result of that? Well, whatever recognition they received from those who saw them, the only recognition they're ever going to have. And with regard to prayer, that was a double loss for them. Because in, short, in the short term, God doesn't bless prayers to... to given to him to satisfy our own fleshly and, 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 and prideful desires. James chapter 4 verse 3 says, You ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it in your own pleasures. But more importantly, they will never see a heavenly reward, or an eternal reward. 1 Corinthians 4 5 says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light things hidden in the darkness and disclose motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him. Now, I understand these Pharisees were unsaved men, and they were not going to have any eternal rewards to begin with. The, but the, in addition to that, God has not obligated himself to hear the prayers of the unsaved other than the prayer of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Jesus wasn't talking here to these Pharisees. He was talking to his own disciples. And he was warning them concerning their own prayers that they should not allow their prayers to become like those of the Pharisees. In other words, they were not to pray with wrongful, prideful, self-serving motives. And that, that can, can, can undermine our prayers and the efficacy of our prayers. And there will be no eternal reward for such praying either. The emphasis, the, 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 to emphasize the importance of guarding against such prideful demonstrations, Jesus admonished in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, that was not intended to suggest that you are not to pray in public or anywhere else you like, would like to pray. In fact, we're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. And the psalmist wrote in Psalm 55, verse 11, it says, For the choir director on the stringed instruments, a masculine of David, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. This was a prayer written by David, but what did he do with it? He gave it to the choir director to be set to music and sung. So it was a public, a public, a public prayer. And Jesus wasn't suggesting in Matthew 6 that we had to go into a private place to pray. He was indicating that prayer, wherever and whenever it's uttered, under whatever circumstances it's uttered, it is to be spoken as to a private audience, meaning our prayers must be directed to God and what others think should make no difference. And when we're praying, it doesn't matter who else is listening or what they think because we're not talking to them to begin with. 
in public prayers and others <coughs> others here, if they want to join in with their amen and, and in so doing become a party to our prayers, then that's that's great, that's fine. But if they choose not to, then that's their option as well. That same principle of reward will be applied to the judgment seat of Christ, and the, and the believer's life and service will be rewarded at the judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, however, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, we know Christians uh, will not be judged for sin. Our sins were all judged in Christ, past, present, and future. And we've told in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation, the word means he is the complete satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. So what did Paul mean when he said, we will each one be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad? He was referring to the believer's works, not our sins, and our works in service for the Lord in our, in our Christian living and our daily ministry. Paul was telling us not all service is necessarily automatically good or acceptable. When God judges our service, it's going to be according, not, not according to the number of our deeds, nor the volume of our deeds, but we read in Matthew 20, verses 12 and 13, when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them received a denarius. And when they, re they received it, they grumbled and the, land the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to, uh, to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered and said to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did I, you not agree with me for a denarius? And the, the, the volume of the work accomplished by these men was, was vastly different. Some had worked only one hour, others of them had worked for the entire day, and yet their pay was equal. It was not unfair because each one had agreed for a denarius when they began their work. Our works are not going to be judged according to, our own, our, to the outward appearance, but believers' deeds will be tested by fire. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of our works. Now, obviously, that has to be symbolic language indicating that our rewards for deeds done with wrong motives will be lost. They'll be consumed as though they'd been burned by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 tell us, If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And if a man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet so is by fire. So it's not that there's no potential of our losing our salvation, but we can lose our rewards because they were based on wrong motives. So our works will be tested by fire to determine their acceptability to God based on our motives when we were doing them. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now, the greater inquiry, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, will not be what we did or how much we did, but why we did the things we did. And the question will be, were we serving to please for the glory of, serve for the glory of God and to please God, or it was to, to satisfy the desires of our own fleshly nature. James put it put it in our in our own uh, as James put it in our own pleasures to our own, for our own pleasures, and it's our motives in life and service that make our deeds and services acceptable to God or unacceptable. And in First Corinthians ten thirty one says, "Whether then therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God." And I pray that you now have the picture that I think it's coming clear to you that we can all and we can all understand the Christian life isn't just an outward conformity to rules or living by the rules. 
In reality, our motives are equally important, if not more important, than our words or our deeds. Now, that's not to say that our words and deeds aren't important, because that's going to be the basis of our judgment and, our, and also of our reward. However, even the best of lives and the greatest of deeds will be unacceptable to God and will go unrewarded if they're products of wrongful motives, if we're doing them for the wrong reasons. You see, living the Christian life and faithfully serving, serve, serving and acceptably serving God is vastly more than just conforming to a legalistic standard or doing the right things. True Christian living must be the product of having uh, been truly transformed by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that transformation brings, begins in the mind. Romans 2, 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the, the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I said all that just to get back to Philippians chapter 4 and the subject of joy and rejoicing. In our text this morning, Paul gives us four principles which, when kept, will allow us to experience the joy and rejoicing in our ministry and service, even in the darkest of times. Now, like probably most of you, my wife and I have experienced some dark times in our life and our experience, but never have we experienced the kind of uncertain darkness we're now facing throughout our nation and around the world. And trusting God to... to, to to shine a ray of light to dispel that darkness, he brought this text to my mind this morning from Philippians chapter 4. And this text reminds us the Lord is the source of our light and hope even in the darkest times. I titled the message Joy and Rejoicing in the Lord. And our rejoicing begins in the peace of Christ. In verse 7 we're told, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I believe Christians sometimes confuse two important truths. There, the, there's a great distinction between peace with God and the peace of God. Peace with God is granted fully and completely to every Christian the instant we embrace Jesus Christ by faith as our personal Savior and Lord. Romans 5, 1 tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the unsaved do not realize that even without any intent or any willful act on their part, they are at war with God. That is, they are the enemies of God. James 4, 4 says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be the friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Now, it was God who took the initiative to provide us an irrevocable peace through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.10 If while we were enemies, we all were enemies, every one of us, before we trusted Christ, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the instant we embrace Jesus Christ by faith as our personal Savior and Lord, we cease to be the enemies of God. And as a result, his recon the reconciling work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and as a result of that work, we will be forever at peace with God. Not only at peace with him, but have a relationship with him. That is the peace with God but the peace of God is distinctly different. The peace of God does not come automatically, nor is it permanent when we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The peace of God only comes as a result of the daily exercise of faith. And the obedience called for in Philippians is somewhat comprehensive. It says in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving that your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing, as we saw last week, is actually a command. Stop worrying about anything. See, God knew us better than we know ourselves. 
We, he knew we're warriors, and some of us are worried right now. I'm pretty sure of that. But God knew that, and so he didn't say, don't ever worry. He said, stop worrying. And so when we, when we find ourselves worrying, we're to stop it immediately, and we do that by prayer and supplication. We fill our minds with praise and adoration toward God and supplication from Him on behalf of ourselves and others around us. And when we indulge in worry, we're not fully trusting God. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, verse 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. When you trust, there isn't any fear. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. See, worry accomplishes nothing. It only serves to rob us of the, of the peace of God, and without which we will not know the joy and rejoicing of our Lord. Jeremiah reminded Israel, that by, and by application reminds us in Jeremiah 17, 7, blessed, the word means happy, Blessed or happy is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. When our trust is wholly and completely in our Lord, we can experience the joy and rejoicing of the Lord even in the darkest of times, times like these in which we're living right now. Now, secondly, we can rejoice in the presence of Christ. Verse 9 says, the things you have the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the god of peace will be with you that's a call to obedience in all things that we've been instructed in and abiding re the presence of god isn't a reference to his being geographically present with us god is omnipresent which be, which is to my mind almost incomprehensible the very thought that that God is, it's difficult for me to wrap my mind around the fact that God can be enthroned in heaven and yet simultaneously present everywhere else at the same time and at all times. And furthermore, in the person of, of, of the Holy Spirit, God or Jesus Christ indwells every believer. Hebrews 13, 5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money being confident that what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you and I will never forsake you. However, even though God is present everywhere at the same time, and he's, he's around us at all times, it's only as we obey that we can expect God to be with us in the sense of helping us and, and, and enabling us in the things that we're doing in our daily lives and ministry. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So our drawing near to God is, is a manifestation of our obedience. And then his drawing near to us is, is in the experience of his presence. Even though God is not present, not any less present, when we fail to obey our perception and experience of his presence is taken away and it leaves us with a sense of being alone without help and without assistance and without hope and if there is was ever been a time when we need to experience his presence and comfort and encouragement and his power that's now and these dark hours through which we're passing thirdly we should rejoice in the power of christ he says i can do all things through him who strengthens me does that sound like a universal declaration? Well, it isn't. God is not going to strengthen us to accomplish things that do not please him. Furthermore, it does not mean that we can undertake and expect God to bless in any ministry we choose to, to, to take unto ourselves as our own choice. What it does mean is God will enable us to succeed in any undertaking which he directs us Two. And Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. God the Holy Spirit is working within every child of God to give us a will to do those things that are pleasing to him and also to empower us to accomplish those things that are pleasing to him. But 
that promise only applies to those things which are according to his good pleasure. And that, of course, is contingent upon allowing the Holy Spirit to direct our lives. We're told in Galatians 5, 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That sounds so simple, so simplistic, and yet it can be so very, very difficult. Walking by the Spirit means allowing the Spirit of God to use the Word of God to accomplish the will of God in and through our lives as the children of God at all times. And as we walk in the Spirit, we can go on rejoicing in the power of Christ. And it is ours, for he is warned in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So we're totally dependent upon him. And so we, we must have his power working in our lives. And it's his, by his power that we can, uh, can accomplish and succeed at all that God expects of us. See, living the list of Christian life is not impossible. But in reality, living perfectly is not impossible. We just don't do it. But we have the power to do it because God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is indwelling us to enable us to do all things. And so it's because we're not totally 100% obedient that we fail. But God expects us to succeed in life and service, even in these trying times we're facing now. And the trials in life, including this, the one labeled uh, COVID-19, are not intended to, to destroy us or to defeat us or to bring us down, but to strengthen our faith and our walk with the Lord, to draw us closer to God. It's not a time, this is not a time to be questioning God or blaming God. It's a time to trust Him. We live in a sin-cursed world, and bad things happen in a sin-cursed world. And boy, are we experiencing them now. But God is still on the throne. God is still in full control, even when everything seems to be running out of control. And finally, we can rejoice in the provision of Christ. Verse 19. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, some, sometimes... The things God knows we need are vastly different from the things we want or that we might even think we need. In fact, some of the things we experience and even people, even the people of God, uh, even things that God brings into our lives or allows to come into our lives may be very distasteful. But you know, it's interesting that almost all Christians allow doctors to, to perform painful surgeries and, get, and inflict painful treatments and send us to painful therapy without objection because we understand the doctor knows best about those things. And in fact, we even pay them for our misery. But we, and, we, and, and we accept that and pay for it because we are confident they're doing it for our benefit. Yet, in the back of our minds, we fully know their abilities are limited, and they do make mistakes, sometimes big ones. God, on the other hand, is, has totally unlimited ability, and he never makes a mistake in any area. And we have his assurance that he knows what is good for us, and he will not allow anything to come into our lives or to be brought into our lives that is not ultimately for our good. That's what we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, all things, for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So in spite of all that, when those difficult times come in our lives, like this COVID-19 virus, even Christians can have difficulty trusting the goodness and faithfulness of God. And ultimately, it's only through that trust, the unflinching faith in God, that we can fully rejoice in the peace of Christ, the presence of Christ, the power of Christ, and the provision of Christ. And when our, when our faith is settled on those, those issues, we can experience the fullness of joy and rejoicing in Jesus Christ, even in the darkness of trial. 
and the glory of our Lord can overcome the darkness in those trials we face in life, whatever they may be and however dark they may become. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you that you are God and there's no other like you. You and you alone are the creator and sustainer of all things. You have made the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. You've even raised the dead. We come to you this morning in faith, this afternoon actually, because we know your power and authority are unlimited and you can do all things. The greatest request we could make of you is infinitesimally small to you. And so it is that we bring our needs to you, our needs regarding this COVID-19 virus. It is it has surprised the world and to date continues to baffle our doctors and medical scientists. But we know that you're not surprised nor are you baffled. Because in this age, you, you generally work through men to accomplish your will. We ask that you would endow our medical personnel with the knowledge and wisdom to enable them to quickly discover both a vaccine and a cure for this deadly infection. And at the same time, we know that while our abilities are limited, yours are unlimited. You are the only one who can give healing. So we call upon you to provide the healing that is so desperately needed. And I do pray further that all of this may be, may, this we may, may ex exercise unflinching faith in you so that we may fully rejoice in the presence of Christ, the peace of Christ, the power of Christ, and the provision of Christ. And when our faith is settled on those issues, we can experience the fullness of joy and rejoicing in our Lord. And the glory of our Lord can and will overcome the darkness of our trials, even in these times. And we thank you in Jesus' name for what you're about to do. Amen.